Let me start by saying thank you so much for having me on your gospel meeting and for the great food that we had for lunch and for the swearing gins for helping uh, taking us out to eat this evening. Uh, it's really nice. Let me start with a question. Has your teenage child, for those of you who have teenage children or have had teenage children, has your teenage child ever came up to you and said, Mom, Dad, I'm about to lie to you. Has your child ever told you that? Maybe just kidding around, but have they told you that uh, in a manner where they were serious? I'm about to lie to you. No, most of the time they're not going to do that. A child, if a child lies, it is because he or she wants you to believe that it's the truth. When a preacher comes before an audience, it is highly unlikely that the preacher is going to start off by saying, now, congregation, I'm about to lie to you. He or she is not going to say that. Now, if you were to question your children, if maybe the situation called for you to be suspicious about this, what would you need for you to believe what they're saying is true? Well, you would need evidence, right? You would need evidence to prove what they're saying is true. And when it comes to the Bible and when it comes to sermons, God has set it up the same way. He has given us the evidence to compare and contrast what the preacher is saying to see if these things are so. Now in this lesson, we want to learn the truth concerning falsehood. Falsehood in, in regards to religious teachings and practices. Now I know that this title may seem a bit odd. Uh, I gave this, this sermon uh, a few weeks ago at a congregation I'm from and the title gave some members uh, a little bit of confusion, the truth about falsehood. But I had to clear, uh, clear it up and say, well, there's no truth in falsehood. That would be an absolute contradiction. But we're going to talk about the truth about falsehood. Falsehood is always false. There is no truth in it. But what about it is true? Well, the first thing I want us to remember be reminded of is that false teaching has always existed. It's always existed. Now, when you think about the prophet Jeremiah, he lived 600 years before Christ. And so he's in the Mosaic time under Moses law. And there, there in that time, God had set in his mind that he was going to send Judah into Babylonian captivity. But before he did, he sent Jeremiah to the people. In Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 30 and 31, there he says, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. False prophets or prophets prophesy falsely and priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? You see, he let them know what was coming, the captivity, the slavery, the punishment. But before he did that, he said, here's the problem. You all have prophets that are prophesying falsely. Along with this, the priests rule by their own power. And not only this, you all love to have it like this. What, what are you going to do in the end? So it was a problem in the time when Moses' law was in effect. People were deviating from the law that God had gave the people. But did you know that false teaching goes even further than that? All the way back to the beginning with Adam and Eve. We reach back all the way back to Genesis. Why did Adam and Eve sin? Yes, it was because they obeyed their lusts. They abused their freedom of choice, their free will. But who initiated the temptation? It was Satan. And how did he do it? 
He told Eve, you shall surely not die. He inserted just one word, not, and that made it a lie. She took of the fruit and ate, and then she had to learn the hard truth, the truth that would hurt. She would die. When G uh, Jesus was talking to those Jews who were being rebellious to him, there in John 8, 44, he told them, look, you, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he lies from his own resources because he's a liar and the father of it. Satan's lie in the beginning was, you shall surely not die. And when Eve fell for that lie, death entered the world. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And so in that regard, Satan has been a murderer from the beginning. Now, why did Eve fall for Satan's lie? It wasn't because Satan forced her to do it. She had a free will. Satan had limits, and he didn't go past the limits that God has set. So why did she be the, believe the lie? She knew exactly what God said. She even repeated it to Satan. But she still believed the lie. Why? Because the lie of Satan, it offered Eve to fulfill her desires. The lie offered the opportunity for her to fulfill her desires. You know, 1 John 2.16, there it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Well, you take that verse and you put it next to Genesis 3, 6. And there it talks about the temptation of Eve. And there it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband with her and he ate. And so you put those two verses together, Genesis 3, 6, 1 John 2, 16, put them together and they match perfectly. You see, she saw the food was, the, she saw the food was good to fulfill the lust of her flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. It was desirable to make one wise. That's the pride of life. Why do so many people fall for false doctrine today, false teachings? One huge reason is they want to hear a message that allows them to do what they want to do. Satan knows this. He's known this all the way from the beginning. When a religious leader tells their members, okay, congregation, don't worry about studying your Bibles. Leave that up to me. I'll do all the work. I got more training. Uh, I, have, I have the Holy Spirit running through me where I can do these things that you cannot. And what do the people do? They step back and say, okay, uh, less work for us, more time to do what we want to do. I mean, you're right. You've had a lot of training. We haven't. We'll leave it up to you. And then some religious teachers will come and they'll uh, come before the audience or congregation. And they'll say things like, you know what? You can do whatever you want. Because God's grace will just cover everything. No matter what you do, no matter how you do it, God will forgive you no matter what. Did you know that that is equivalent to saying, eat and you shall not surely die. False teachers exist in the world. The truth hurts sometimes. But if we abide by the truth, then it turns into satisfaction. How so? Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. And here we have a very familiar passage for many of us. In Matthew chapter 4, we have the temptation of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, there starting with verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now notice, Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Now the Spirit is not tempting Jesus. 
But the Holy Spirit is leading Jesus to the place where he would be tempted. The one who is tempting, verse 1 says, is by the devil. Verse 2, and we had, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him up on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Put this passage next to 1 John 2.16. Also next to Genesis 3, 6. And here you'll find that the way Satan tempted Eve back in Genesis is the same way he tempted Jesus there in the wilderness. There he says, turn the stones into bread. He appealed to his lust of the flesh. If you're the son, throw yourself down. That's the pride of life. And then he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. Jesus looked at this. And so Satan appealed to the lust of the eyes. But the difference between Jesus and Eve is Jesus overcame all three. Now, how did he do it? He knew Scripture. It is written. It is written. It is written. And you know Satan quoted Scripture, but he used it falsely. So it is possible to take a verse out of context and use it in the wrong way. And Jesus came back with another verse that would clear up his false teaching. You see, how can we overcome temptation? We have to know Scripture. How can we identify false teaching? Well, we, we, we need to know the Scriptures. But did you know that verse 11 says, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. You see, after he overcame and he used Scripture correctly, God took care of him. God was pleased with Jesus. You know, if we learn and apply the truth, God will be pleased, and that, that pleases us. Knowing that God is pleased first, it pleases us. Our satisfaction comes when we know that God is satisfied. Brethren and friends, falsehood was, it was an issue back in the beginning. It was an issue under Moses' law. Now, all those hundreds and thousands of years, is it possible that after Christ did his work, that all of a sudden false teaching is absent from the world? Think about it. All of a sudden, now that Christ did his work, everybody's free to teach it whatever they want. God punished over and over. He punished people for living falsely and heeding the false doctrine ever since the beginning. You know, in the New Testament, God warns us multiple times over and over be careful with false teaching. Did you know that almost every New Testament letter, every New Testament letter has some kind of warning, some kind of command about false teaching? The only exception is the book of Philemon. There in that book, Paul did give a warning on how he had to treat this new Christian and to do otherwise would go against the truth. 
But besides Philemon, all the other New Testament letters has something to say about either false doctrine or a commandment to teach only what God gives. Let me just give you a few passages for us. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28 through 32, there Paul comes to the Ephesian elders. He gathers them up and he's been with them for about three years, but he's going to leave. Before he leaves, he tells them these words. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn you, everyone, night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You notice how he said that in verse 31. He warned them for three years with tears. He got Paul emotional. Paul didn't go up and say, well, <clears throat> just let you know, there's, there's going to be some false teachers. And uh, just, just be careful with them, you know. Uh, don't hurt their feelings. He didn't talk like that. He said, for three years I was crying. I was crying telling you all these things. And rightfully so. False teaching causes people to be condemned. Because look, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. Well, what does the word of grace do? What does God's word do? It's able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. And so what is, what is false teaching going to do? What are the savage wolves going to give them? They're going to give them words that tear them down. They're going to lose their inheritance. And he's crying because of this. Also, we have Colossians 2.8. Beware lest anyone treat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Another warning, 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many of will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're from God. Because why? Many false prophets have gone out into the world. Titus 1, 12 through 14. There at the end it says that their te this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the what? Turn from the truth. So where are they turning to? They're turning to falsehood. And so we have warning after warning. I could go on and on and give you each one that's given in each New Testament letter, but I think we get the idea. How can we escape the fact that through the New Testament pages, God warns us over and over, there will be false teachers. Now, how is truth found? Truth is found when preachers preach the word. Now, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And here we have Paul. He's talking to the evangelist there in Ephesus. His name is Timothy. And he writes this second letter at the tail end of his life, Paul's life. And there in chapter 3, very familiar passage for us, but we're going to see how some of these familiar passages work together. There he's telling the evangelist, Timothy, how he is to do his work. And there he says in verse 16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so what he's giving him is the nature of God's word, God's message. What he gets from God, all the scripture, all the writings, it's God breathed. The, the, the ancient manuscripts will tell us. They translate that word, inspiration translates the word, which means God breathed. It comes from God. It originates from his mind. Well, the words that are given in Scripture by God, they're profitable. And look at what they give us. Well, the man of God is going to be complete. And so because of this nature of the word, Paul is going to give Timothy a commandment. Because he goes in chapter 4 and verse 1, I charge you therefore. That word therefore is pointing back to what was just said. Based on the nature of the word, therefore, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Here it is. Here's the command. Preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why, are you, why do you need to preach the word? Well, I just told you. Based on the nature of the word, which is the scriptures, you need to preach it because of that. And not only just preach it, but preach it in the way that I have commanded you. Be ready in season and out of season. You preach it when they like it. You preach it when they don't like it. You convince, rebuke, exhort. Did you know that there is a logical order to these three words? Convince them. That this is the truth that God has stated. Rebuke them when they are not following what God has stated. But then he says, exhort, encourage them to do what they should. And so it's a logical order that the preacher has. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. But that's not the only reason. Not just because the nature of the word but there's another reason, Timothy, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth. Well, if they turn away from the truth, what do they turn to and be turned aside to fables? But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And you know, it's no wonder why Paul goes on to say what he does in the next verses. Because he talks about the word. He says, this, Timothy, this is what you need to preach. And this is why. And there's going to be people that won't want it. But you fulfill your ministry. And look at me at the tail end of my life. He says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. But not to me only, but to also to all those who have loved his appearing. And so it all works together very beautifully. Paul is looking back at his life. He's examining his past Christian life and Throughout his Christian life, he preached the word. And Timothy, this is what I want for you. Fulfill your ministry and you can have the confidence at the end of your life that you have done what God has wanted you to do. Truth. Truth is found when preachers preach the word. But you know, it's not just about preaching the word. Preachers also have to strive to teach the whole counsel of God. Back in Acts chapter 20, when Paul was talking to the elders, there in verse 27, he said, For I have, I have not shunned to declare you the whole counsel of God. He was there three years, and he didn't waste time. He didn't spend three years on one verse. He gave them what they needed. He gave them and prepared them. Now, I know, I know 
I know that we're, we're all always learning, right? Uh, even the preacher. There's always something to learn. There's, there's no point where we say, well, I don't think there's any more to learn. I think I got it all. So, yes, in a sense, there, there's always something new to preach. But do preachers strive to preach the whole counsel of God? That's what needs to be done. You know, when uh, a preacher preaches on John 3.16 for an entire year and doesn't touch on any other scriptures, that person has no clear intentions to preach the whole counsel of God. When a priest reads the same few passages every year, the same few throughout the year, and then he starts it over in January, he has no clear intention to preach the whole counsel of God. When a person gives a Disney movie and tries to pull the morals out of that story, barely or not even touching the word, that's not preaching the word. When a preacher goes up and he says, well, I want to tell you about my fantastic weekend and then tries to pull morals out of that, that's not preaching the word. Now, illustrations are fine. Illustrations allow us to show how we can apply biblical truths. Sometimes they show how what the Bible teaches coincides with the reality around us. But you know why so many people are falling for falsehood today? Because they're not getting enough of the word. They're not getting enough of the word. But you know, it's not just the preacher's responsibility. It's also, it also involves people studying the word. The preacher can preach truth all day, or maybe he may not, but it's all the members, all the people have a responsibility to check the work of the preacher. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Now, Paul is in Berea, and he comes to these Jews... Now, we know that at this time he's talking to them. They are not Christians, okay? Now, they're Jews, and the time of Moses' law has passed. Now it's time to obey Christ's law. But notice what he says about them. In Acts chapter 17, in verse 10, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness, searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Okay, so, we see that these individuals, they're not Christians yet. But notice the Holy Spirit through the hand of Luke who wrote the book of Acts. Notice how he deems these people. They are deemed fair minded, noble minded, which means well minded. They have good minds. Now, why do they have good minds? God is taking notice of this. Well, we see that they received the word with all readiness. They were attentive to what Paul was saying. You know, many today, they fall for falsehood because they do not even listen to the sermons that are happening. Sometimes they don't even come to the services. Sometimes they do come and maybe their minds drift off every time. Uh, and they, they love it that way. Maybe it, to them it's time to check the Facebook or to go outside or do something else. Some brethren think that as long as you take the Lord's Supper, you don't have to hear the sermon. There are actually individuals who take the Lord's Supper and then walk out the door. But these individuals, they're well-minded. They're well-minded because they, they were ready to listen. But they didn't stop there. They tested the message. They searched the scriptures daily. Now, what scriptures is he talking about? Notice the, back in the beginning of 17. Paul was there in Thessalonica 
And in verse 2, then Paul, notice this, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned for, with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And so this is what he did when he went into the synagogues. It was his custom, which means that's what he would have done in Berea. He would have got the Old Testament scriptures, what they had, showed them the prophecies and said, look at what Jesus did. He fulfills all the prophecies. He had to have gone through this. The Bereans took this and said, well, we're going to search this ourselves. They took those prophecies and they saw, yes, Paul's right. Now you think about this. Paul is an apostle sent directly from Jesus. Now, I don't know if he did miracles at this point, but maybe he had to have had some reputation that he had done miracles. But either way, they were still going to search the scriptures daily to see if they were so. You know why so many people fall into falsehood? They don't listen to the sermon. And when they do, they don't study it for themselves. Now, how is truth not found? We saw how truth is found. Truth is not found by our feelings or opinions or what we think is right. Do you remember Paul, formerly Saul, there in Acts 26 and verse 9, he says, Indeed, I myself thought that I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He thought. He thought that this was right. Sometimes our thoughts can deceive ourselves. Paul thought that he was doing the will of God. Consider this. Paul was not an atheist when he was Saul. He wasn't a skeptic. He was someone who followed God of heaven. And he thought that the way to follow God was to go against this so-called Fake Messiah Jesus. At least it was fake to him. Paul was a strict Pharisaic Jew. He was the religious elite of the day. And he thought wrong. And Jesus comes to him and he sets the record straight. And because of that, Paul had to change his entire way of life. He had to change his entire mindset. He lost everything because he obeyed the truth. But what he gained, he gained everything. He gained salvation. Brethren and friends, we have to be careful because our feelings can deceive ourselves. Eve, her desires deceived her. The, the people in Jeremiah's day, they, they loved these false prophets. Paul says that people wants their, want their ears tickled. It's not about what we want. It's about what God wants. But furthermore, the truth is not relative. Those who promote this idea that say that, well, the Bible truths, you know, they're lost. There's no way to find out what anything ever means. And so, you know, how can we even tell who a false teacher is? You know, that actually teaches that God does not know how to preserve the truth that we need. Now, we understand that there are passages that are hard to understand. Second Peter chapter 3, Paul, uh, Peter talks about some of Paul's writings were hard to understand. But hard to understand does not mean impossible. Hard to understand means it takes more effort on our part to understand them. And notice that Peter says some of Paul's writings are hard to understand. Which means what? There are many of Paul's teachings that are pretty much easy to understand. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, take a very simple verse from Paul. There he says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, you do not have to get uh, a group of Bible scholars into a room to try to figure out what that verse means. <clears throat> therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So God commands us, understand what I want. Now, here's a question. 
How can we obey that simple command when all the rest of God's commands are impossible to understand? How can it be true that we are to understand what God wants, but then turn around and say, well, no one can truly understand it? It's a contradiction to God's word. Truth is not found by the social climate of the day. Might does not make right. Did you know that it is possible to take a thousand people, put them in one building, and they all be wrong? Think about Noah's time. Noah's family was the only one, were the only ones that were saved. Everyone else was lost. It is possible for many people to be wrong. Did you know that over 45,000 people gathered together in one building to hear Joe Olstein? Now, Joe Olstein, we love his soul, just like we love all souls. And we hope and pray that one day he'll turn from his ways. But when he goes up there, he preaches that you can go choose whatever church that you want. It doesn't matter where you go, just choose, choose what you want. And those 45,000 people will leave and they'll do just that. And then he has admitted that he will not preach the whole counsel of God. He has said, well, I will not preach on hell. I will not teach on anything about concerning uh, condemnation. And so he has admitted that he will not give the people everything. And the people love to have it so. Truth is also not found in your parents. Now, this might strike a nerve with some of us, right? Maybe we're not fully understanding this because, you know, even myself, my parents, they taught me the truth. And maybe there's some in here, your parents taught you the truth. But where did truth originate? It didn't originate in your parents' minds. Not in my parents' mind. Our parents simply pointed us to where we can find truth. They pointed us to the Bible. We took it and we studied for ourselves. Hopefully that is what we did. And when we found that these things were so, we obeyed the truth. And yes, we're thankful for them pointing, the, pointing us to truth. But it didn't originate with them. But many people out there, they have this mindset. We're all going to be in this particular religion I'm going to be in this particular denomination because, well, my parents were in it. Sometimes the truth hurts. And because of that, many people don't want to hear it because they don't want to hear the possibility of their parents being wrong. And they'll say things like, well, so you're saying that my parents are lost? What can we say to that? Well, first thing you can point out is, I'm not saying anything. I'm just pointing what the Bible says. You see, you redirect their minds to what God says and then let them make the choice. Truth is also not found in religious leaders just because of their positions. There are some false doctrines that have grown very strong, not because people want their ears tickled. That is a problem for many denominations. But there are other religious organizations where they're growing strong, not because they hear what they want to hear, but because they think that the, the religious leader somehow cannot make a mistake. There's, there's no way he has so much schooling. I mean, look at the way he's dressed. Or they'll say, look, he has the Holy Spirit flowing in him. There's no way that he can give any error. And so... Even if they get hard commands to follow, they'll do it because they'll say the religious leaders are, are flawless. But brethren, let me remind you that Saul, at the time he thought he was doing right, Saul was of the religious elite of the day. He was a strict Pharisaic Jew and he was trained under the best Jewish doctor of the law, Gamaliel. And yet he was still wrong. Now later on he did obey and yes the Holy Spirit did work through him to give flawless teachings and so the question is asked well how do we know that he, he spoke truth as, a, as this Christian? 
Well, what if he thought wrong under there? How do we know that that wasn't the case? Well, the Bible tells us why. You want to know why people knew for sure that Paul was giving the truth? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, there Paul tells them about the signs of an apostle, of the apostles that were done among them with perseverance, and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Here's a question. Who in this world today can do the signs that the apostles did? That's how the people knew it was truth. The signs and the miracles that they did. I mean, there in Acts chapter 19, they took the handkerchiefs and aprons off Paul's body. They took it to the sick people and they were healed. The demons left them. And what we're talking about in Acts chapter 5 where Peter is going down the street and his very shadow just touches people and they were healed. Peter tells a man to rise up from being lame for many, many years. Who does that today? That's how they knew. It was confirmed by the miracles. Well, no one can do that today. Well, rightfully so. God has given us all there is to know, all that we need for salvation. I mean, even the miracles that they did even caused Simon the sorcerer to know that it was the truth. In Acts chapter 8. And so today, those who preach the truth, or those who preach, they need to teach using God's word, striving to teach all of it, and use it correctly. And if you are listening or you're visiting and you're, you're from another religious organization, Think about your, the sermons that you hear, the lessons. If the preacher is not using scripture, then ask yourself, why not? If the preacher only focuses on few passages throughout his entire career, ask yourself, what about the rest? Well, if your preacher does use the Bible, are you studying it for yourself? These things that I'm going to give you this week, it's not to just stay here in this building. These are things for you to take, meditate on, study for yourselves, to see if these things are so. Check my work. Don't take my word for it. And brethren, what will you do knowing that many out there are falling for false doctrine? Does this not motivate you to evangelize more and more to a lost and dying world for millions and millions of people and all the people that are in Tulsa, all the people that are in Uliga, falling for false doctrine? You know, on my drive over here, I saw religious denomination after denomination after denomination and then the Uliga Church of Christ. Many people have fallen for falsehood. What are we going to do about that? Friends, those of you who are visiting or listening on the recordings, maybe some things uh, that you heard here have been very hard for you to hear. Well, we can help you. Let's set up a Bible study. Call us. We can help you find someone who can study the Bible with you to see what there is to be done. God has instructed us in Acts 2 to hear the word of God, hear the gospel, believe it, repent, confess, and be baptized. And there God adds you to the church because he washes away your sins, creates a new person in Christ. If you have a need this evening, why don't you come as we stand and sing?